Hello, everyone. Thank you very much again to, to come to, to the Monday Majlis. There is a good number of us here and people are, are still joining. And we all have good reasons to be here because we are going to listen to Hansian. And I, I met Hansian at the same MESA conference as our speaker last week, Aisha. And uh, it was in, in December, and the circumstances were similar. I went to a panel, I heard a great talk, and then I, 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 I met, met with the speaker, and, and uh, we agreed on uh, that, that we would like to hear the person to, to give a match list. And um, <clears throat> so, so this um, Hansen is going to, to talk on. Uh, Ibn al Jawzi and and uh, uh, Mirror for Princes, and uh, Ibn al Jawzi was obviously a great wise man, and as it happens, Hansian means great, great man and wise. So no no one could could give a better insight uh, than than well he's distinct by by his name. <laughs> To, to achieve great things, and he does. So, Ancien, please, I, I, will, I will silent myself and we will listen to you, your wisdom, your great wisdom. <laughs> well, I, I hope I can, I can measure up, you know, about at, at least one tenth to, to Ibn al Chamsi's greatness. Um, so, first of all, I want to especially thank uh, Ishvan for uh, inviting me to be part of the, uh, you know, these, these majalis, uh, you know, on, on, on Mondays, uh, it was really, I mean, it was really great delight meeting you and, and speaking with you at, uh, at Mesa last year. Um, all right, so my, my topic today is actually uh, part of my uh, larger book project on Ibn al-Jawzi's political thought, uh, which ultimately aims to interrogate a larger question. And, and th this question is about the relationship between um, political thinking, eloquence, and emotions. Um, <clears throat> this officially, well, officially began as uh, with my dissertation research at Harvard, uh, but but the spark for it actually, you know, if you're looking at a, at a kind of longer arc uh, kind of journey, the, the, the spark for it actually began when I was an undergrad um, at Wesleyan University. Uh, this is a a, a a liberal arts college uh, in uh, Middletown, Connecticut. Um, this was also when I started to become interested in Islamic and Middle Eastern history. Uh, after taking a course on the Ottoman Empire uh, by Bruce Masters, uh, you know he was uh, an, an Ottoman uh, historian and, and is now retired. Um, uh, and, and at the same time, I was also becoming interested in uh, political thought and political theory. Uh, and in fact, uh, a large chunk, a uh, pretty substantial portion of my undergrad education was spent reading. Uh, works of modern, actually mo modern Western social and political theory. So going from uh, Enlightenment thinkers like uh, Thomas Hobbes and then going all the way to the modern period, you know, more recent um, philosophers like Hannah Arendt and uh, Foucault. Um, and while reading these books, uh, I, was, I was also curious to see uh, what political theory would look like from the Islamic side of things. And so I remember uh, emailing uh, Bruce Masters at that time. I mean, they, they, you know, this is it's a, it's a liberal arts college. So usually, you know, in, in history departments, you only have one professor, you know, being in charge of everything, you know, Middle Eastern history related. So, you know, Bruce Masters was teaching a course on medieval Islamic history. He was teaching a course on Ottoman history, this was the kind of early modern portion of it. And then he taught, taught a course on, on the modern Middle East as well. And, and so I remember emailing him, you know, just, just contacting him and and um and uh, uh and I was asking him for recommendations uh for readings on Islamic political thought and Islamic political theory. Um and he recommended that I read Anne Lambton's uh, State and Government in Medieval Islam, uh, which was published in 1981. Uh, and this became the first book I ever read um, on Islamic political thought, uh, way before I felt comfortable enough to uh, read uh, classical Arabic texts, uh, let alone analyze them uh, in any detail. Um, now, overall, the, the Lambton book was a great read. Uh, this was, after all, my first uh, exposure to the field, uh, and I certainly learned a lot from it. Uh, but I did also remember uh, coming away from it um, feeling like, you know, somehow the, the history of Islamic political thought uh, was ultimately a very, you know, kind of a very sad and tragic story. Um, 
you know, for, for those of you who are not familiar with Lambton, uh, especially the book, um, the broad narrative uh, in broad strokes was basically that uh, as social political upheaval became more frequent in the medieval Islamic world, Muslim thinkers gradually uh, sacrificed the lofty ideals of the Sharia and supported absolutist rule in order to preserve uh, uh, social stability, uh, which in turn led to the adoption of political quietism uh, as the order of the day. So, I mean, th this is the very broad you know, outline of, of Lampton's overall um, arguments. Uh, so in a way, when, when faced with uh, unjust and sinful rulers, it was much better to, in a way, tolerate the tyrant than to disturb the peace by taking up arms in rebellion. Uh, when it comes to religious scholars, the ulama, uh, it was better for them to keep their distance from these rulers in order to maintain uh, their spiritual and moral conscience. Um, now, for, for Lambton, these, these developments had been underway uh, ever since the 8th century and the 9th century, is, you know, especially after all, all the different fitnas in the Islamic world. Uh, but for her, they, they, they eventually became rationalized uh, in writings uh, starting in the late Abbasid period uh, with thinkers like uh, al-Mawardi and al-Ghazali and culminating uh, in the Mamluk period with thinkers like Ibn Jamal. Uh, and so, you know, after reading this, I, I, I remember wondering at that time, you know, if, if, uh, if, if, if this was it for uh, medieval Islamic political thought. Uh, I was particularly interested uh, in the late Abbasid period, uh, when the Abbasid Caliph was no longer, uh, you know, was no longer the sole uh, political and military power uh, in the Middle East, uh, and, you know, had by, by this time had become uh, more like a moral and religious symbol uh, for the Muslim community, especially the, the, the Sunni Muslim community. Um, and so I remember starting my doctoral research uh, with this, you know, supposed grand and ambitious and naive plan to uh, you know, to want to challenge this Lambton narrative by, by in a way, doing the late Abbasid period justice, you know, wanting to, in a way, save this period uh, in, in a certain way. Uh, and I remember writing in my dissertation proposal uh, that I was going to uh, look at all the different genres in which political thought was discussed. And I remember just right after I defended my proposal, uh, my doctoral advisor, Roy Motahede, uh, said to me, uh, congratulations on your 30-year project. And, um, uh, but uh, I think either because I was too stubborn or I did not get the hint, I, I still went forward with, with this, you know, with this research. I was reading different genres of work that touched on political thought, uh, especially, especially works that touched on the topic of the caliphate, because this, this was my entry point into the field uh, of Islamic political thought. And uh, this eventually brought me to uh, two genres, and that is the theological and juridical uh, uh, writings, the, the, the kalam and fiqh uh, text, uh, where uh, the subject of the caliphate uh, or, or, or imamate, which is, you know, which it, it is often called in these texts, um, would be discussed. Uh, in the final chapter of a particular Usul al-Din text, or, or at least in, in one of the final chapters of, 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 these, of these books. Um, and in reading these texts, uh, two things occurred. Um, one is that I, um, I discovered that I hardly had anything coherent to say about them. <laughs> Uh, it was that point in the dissertation research that I, you know, I just noticed that I, I mean, I'm sure those of you who have written dissertations, you would, you know, I'm sure you've been through this, you know, you just keep on reading and reading and reading uh, without any way to, in a way, weave things together into a coherent narrative or angle. Um, um, and, you know, this, there's this idea, there's this sense that I got that perhaps this, this project was maybe getting too big uh, to be completed uh, in a timely manner. Um, and and now the, the the second thing that happened uh, is that uh, as I was reading the these uh, theological and juridical texts, uh, I kind of got I, I kind of got the sense that perhaps the Lambton narrative was not so completely off the mark. Uh, I did sense this kind of realist kind of streak of political thought that scholars like uh, Lambton and and before her Gibb. Uh, we're talking about uh, when reading um, the theological and juridical texts. Um, now here, I, I, I just want to say that this was based on my reading of, of these caliphate chapters uh, in these treatises many, many years back. Um, but, but in more recent years, uh, there has been 
uh, literature and, and scholarly works that um, provide a more nuanced and expansive readings of these texts that I, I, I think really directly challenge this Lambton uh, thesis. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking of works by Sohaira Siddiqui and uh, Muhammad al uh monograph uh, on um, Mamluk political thought that was recently published by uh, Edinburgh University Press. Uh, but but at least for me at that time, uh, I, I I unfortunately had a much narrower reading of, of these texts, and I I, I and then got to a point where I, I did not really see you know an end in sight for this project. Uh, and and it was then that I began to ask myself uh, if you know was I asking the wrong question all this while. Um, so maybe instead of uh, trying to completely overturn this grand you know, narrative of Islamic political thought, uh, I began to ask if uh, there were other ways uh, in which pre-modern Muslims thought and wrote about politics and government. And so this is where Ibn al-Jawzi uh, comes into the picture. Um, I had read about Ibn al-Jawzi before, um, and many of uh, my sources on the later Basid period uh, and, and 12th century Baghdad, especially uh, both uh, primary sources and secondary sources, um, they would often kind of circle me back to Ibn al Jawzi himself. So you know it, he was he was kind of hard, it was kind of hard to escape when when when, when I was doing my my, my research. Um, but up until then, uh, I had known him primarily as a historian uh, who wrote the multi-volume. Uh, chronicle uh, titled Al Muntazam uh, Fi Tarikh Al Umam Al Muluk, um, which I, I had actually read during my first year uh, at Harvard in Roy Matahede's um, uh, graduate seminar. Um, but going further, I soon realized that uh, although his most well known work today is the Muntazam, uh, during his time, among his contemporaries, uh, Ibn al Jazi was much better known for his preaching, much better known for his role as a as a, as a preacher. And at some point, uh, I had come across uh, his Mirror for Princess, uh, the Mesbah Hamudi, which, you know, which we'll, we'll, uh, I'll talk about later on. Uh, and and the, the Mesbah became the first uh, political text by Ibn al-Jawzi that I read. Uh, and after reading more from him, I, I gradually realized that uh, this, was, this was a different form of political discourse from what I had encountered uh, in the legal and, the and theological genres. So, for instance, there's uh, there's quite a lot of emphasis on piety, um, you know, the piety of the ruler uh, when compared to uh, thinkers who were prepared to forego this quality uh, in favor of rulers who were able to maintain order and stability. Um, there's also a lot of emphasis on uh, rhetorical tools uh, to achieve political goals, uh, which is, you know, uh, not surprising since Ibn al Jazi was a preacher after all. Um, but up to this point, uh, I, I mainly saw myself as a historian of uh, medieval Islamic political thought, pure and simple. Uh, but reading Ibn al Jawzi's writings uh, slowly made me interested in how um, eloquence and good speech and rhetoric, I mean, rhetoric broadly defined, uh, and how, how these things co connected to political thinking. Um, and it so happened uh, that when I was doing research for the dissertation, uh, I had served as a teaching assistant uh, for a course on European intellectual history uh, taught by James Hankins, uh, who is a, a scholar of uh, Italian humanism during the Renaissance. Uh, and um, teaching this course and also talking to, to, to Jim, I remember just reading a lot of, quite, quite a lot of stuff on the role of eloquence and speech in politics, uh, which uh, and, and which in turn gave me a framework to think about Ibn al Jawzi uh, as both a preacher and 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 as a uh, a, a political thinker as well, um, and this would form uh, one of the themes uh, in the this in the dissertation which I eventually submitted. Um, now all of this was before the question of emotions uh, came into the picture. Uh, the emotions angle. Uh, 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 was actually a more recent development. This, this is kind of post-dissertation. Uh, in, in, in the process of uh, turning the dissertation into a book, uh, I, <clears throat> I, uh, did, I did decide to add a chapter on Ibn al-Jawzi's uh, sermons, uh, in, in, in particular sermons uh, that were delivered in the mode of wa'ath, right, which is usually translated as 
hortatory preaching or popular preaching, depending on um, which, uh, you know, which, which works you read. Um, <clears throat> and, and I remember reading these sample sermons by Ibn al-Jawzi uh, during the, you know, the pandemic. This was during the lockdown period. Everybody was indoors and it was a very depressing time. And, and, and just coming across passage after passage. And then by, by the way, these sermons were all delivered in the second person. So that you, when you read it, it's, it's as if he's talking to you. He's kind of delivering a sermon to you. And I just remember reading passage after other passage. You know, telling me to, you know, that I have to remember death, you know, remember that death is near, uh, you know, reminding me how I'm a sinner and how I should repent of my sinful ways. And so, you know, it slowly just it really just hit me that uh, these sermons were full of emotions, uh, or at least they were trying to conjure up um, certain emotions in their listeners or readers uh, in the attempt to steer them towards uh, certain uh, spiritual dispositions or pious acts. Um, now, of course, not looking back now, you know this this seems you know fairly obvious. Uh, you know, I mean, of course, you know a preacher would want to use his his words to you know to to invoke certain kinds of uh, emotions in his audience. Uh, but but it did take me quite a while actually to to arrive at this observation uh, because I I was not I did not see myself as a sermon study scholar. I I, I had no prior, you know, training in analyzing sermons and, or, or you know, let, let alone khutbahs in, in, in the Islamic tradition. Uh, but in any case, this, this discovery really just opened up a, you know, a new lens and a perspective for me to, to talk about Ibn al-Jawzi, to, 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 you know, to, to see what was interesting about, about his work, rather than just consider him as, you know, a simple political thinker. Um, so just zooming out, um, I you know now now going back to my to my current book project, I I, I really see this project as in a way broadening the conversation uh, about medieval Islamic political thought uh, to look beyond uh, the political discourses of jurists and theologians, which um, have really been the the bedrock of this field, and 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 these discourses are usually very um, scholastic; they're usually very dialectical in nature, um, you know. Based on based on what what you would observe, especially in in, in Kalam treatises, um, and, and and so through the writings of Ibn al-Jawzi, uh, I I'm trying to see uh, what Islamic political thought would look like uh, when written from the perspective of a preacher, uh, a preacher whose political discourses were characterized more by uh, an exhortative and homiletic mode of persuasion rather than scholastic disputation, like you see with writings by Juwaini, Ghazali, Mawardi, for instance. Um, and I'm not saying that uh, jurists and theologians don't matter in the history of Islamic political thought, in fact, far from that. Uh, but what I'm saying is that uh, they represent one among several clusters of political discourse in Islamic history uh, in, you know, in a way that the ideas of the fuqaha and the mutakalimun had to coexist alongside other clusters of, of political vocabulary, uh, including those of the preachers. Uh, so really, uh, my, 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 my ultimate hope is that, you know, this book will be, you know, at least one step towards uh, creating a picture of Islamic political thought uh, that is characterized by uh, competing approaches to political power uh, rather than this linear and you know seemingly tragic tale of decline uh, consisting of realist uh, jurists and theologians, uh, so um, this was over overall my my journey uh, to to this to this project and, and in a way to to today's talk. So uh, if you have any questions at all, I, I I'll be happy to to follow up on anything that I that I said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hansi. And you really embedded very well uh, your coming talk. I was wondering whether you want to talk about yourself at all, uh, of, of how did you come at, at all into this, these studies, uh, mm. or, or you, would, you would prefer to save your time for even now, Jose. <laughs> well, I, I, um, I mean, just you know, in terms of background, I, I'm, I'm personally from from Malaysia. I, um, and you know, in in Malaysia, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a Muslim country. It's a majority Muslim country, but uh, I, I grew up, you know, in, 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 you know, in a Chinese background, and you know, did not grow up in, you know, with a Muslim background at all. But, um, I, I, I was always curious about about Islam. Um, but the thing with Malaysia is that. Uh, there are laws to 
in a way, kind of prevent debates about religion uh, in public. Um, you know, you you could get detained uh, if if uh, you know these debates you know kind of flare up and 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 cause um, you know social tension. Um, and so that that that, that was you know it, it, you know in, in a way I, I think Malaysia is in, kind of interesting. It's, it's very multi ethnic. It's very multi religious. But but it, it's there's also a lot of boundaries between different communities you know different racial communities different religious communities and so I, I felt that I you know I'm kind of growing up in a Muslim country without really understanding Islam um, you know as a religion beyond what you see in media and what you know friends and family talk about uh, and so um, uh, I you know and 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 in in you know in the in the history textbooks in Malaysia uh, there is about six chapters on Islamic civilization, um, uh, and uh, this was this was in, in a way my, my my first kind of brief exposure to Islam. And I remember reading about the the Umayyads and the Abbasids in, in these textbooks, uh, but only very briefly. Um, and so that kind of began the in, my interest. And, and 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 I and I really told myself, you know, when when I go to college, you know, um, I am going to. Take courses on 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 Middle Eastern history to 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 better understand this. And and at that time, I was I was actually very interested in the in the Ottomans and and you know with Bruce Masters at, at Wesleyan, um, you know this was this was you know a great opportunity for for me to I mean not only learn about Islam but but also learn about the Middle East. Um, you know this was I I grew you know as, as a teenager you know nine eleven happened and. And and there was a lot of news about the Middle East coming from from you know Iraq and so just reading about these things and you know not really have, having a lot of context to situate them and and so I I really gave myself a promise that I I wanted to better understand these different developments you know kind of have a more long durée um, historical understanding uh, of of what what was going around around what was going on around me uh, in in the world at that time. Thank you, thank you, I Hansen. I I think. Well, it was certainly very interesting for me to hear. So, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. So, should, should I start the, the the talk now? Okay. All right. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, but, well, again, thank you all uh, again for being here, uh, and, and also again, especially to to Ishvan for um, inviting me to be part of this. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this uh, my talk today is actually taken from from my current book project on Ibn Al Jaldi's political thought, uh, and and it's largely based on a chapter uh, about a mirror for princes written by him, uh, and this is the work titled Al Misbah Al Mudi fi Khilafat Al Mustadi. Uh, translated, you know, it would you would uh, read as uh, the radiant lamp in the caliphate of Al Mustadi. Uh, now, uh, the title uh, pretty much gives it away. Uh, this is a mirror for princes uh, written and dedicated to Ibn al Jawzi's patron, uh, the Abbasid Caliph, uh, the, the Abbasid Caliph al Mustadi, uh, who ruled from 1170 to 1180. Uh, and as I hope to demonstrate uh, in this talk, uh, the Misbah demonstrates the importance of taking into account the role of emotions, uh, not only when studying how scholars advise rulers, but also when studying medieval Islamic political thought in general. Uh, so now, uh, uh, before I dive into this work, uh, the, the, just, just a few items to lay some uh, groundwork. Uh, so first of all, the, the study of emotions. Um, now, my, my approach to studying emotions in Islamic history and Islamic political thought uh, draws largely from a field uh, called the, the history of emotions. Uh, for those of you who are already familiar uh, with this field, uh, please bear with me for a bit uh, while I explain these different uh, frameworks. Um, now, in the history of, of emotions, uh, the key goal is to study how historical change can be traced when accounting for human emotions as an analytical category. Uh, and there are, uh, there are mainly three approaches that I have relied on heavily for this book. Uh, the first is William Reddy and his concept of emotives, uh, which are basically uh, emotional statements or statements that we make about our own emotions. Now for Reddy, 
uh, emotives not, do not only describe or express emotions, uh, but what he says is that they also have the potential to impact the people around us. Uh, and so, which means that when, when, when you read this large at the level of society, uh, this also means that emotional statements uh, uttered by people have the potential uh, to bring about historical change. Uh, another scholar who has been hugely influential on my work uh, is Barbara Rosenwein uh, and her concept of emotional communities, uh, which she defines as, quote, groups of people animated by common or similar interests, values, and emotional styles and evaluations. Now, up to this point, uh, it's important to note that uh, both Reddy and Rosenwein uh, largely rely on emotion words, uh, so emotion words or emotional vocabulary. So that there's been uh, quite a number of critiques uh, about these two scholars that their, their, their approaches are very logo centric. Uh, but you know, what, what if there are no uh, expl explicitly stated emotion words? Uh, and I think this is where the emotional script approach uh, comes into handy. Uh, whereby the focus is on particular topoi uh, that build up to an emotionally charged experience, even when there are no emotion words uh, involved. Uh, so in this vein, uh, particular kinds of weeping, uh, yelling, fainting uh, can all be construed as emotional events or emotional experience uh, based on certain contexts. Okay, so now that I've just briefly outlined these uh, approaches, I'm gonna now, gonna now shift to uh, Ibn al-Jawzi himself, um, for, for those of you who are not familiar with him. Now to begin, uh, Ibn al-Jawzi lived and flourished in Baghdad during the 12th century. Uh, his writings touched virtually every field in the Islamic intellectual tradition, uh, but the one field in which he excelled was the field of Wa'az. Uh, again, as I mentioned, is usually translated as hortatory preaching or popular preaching. Um, and in fact, the 12th century, I, I argue, uh, was, was quite the age of the, the wu'ad or, or the hortatory preachers. Uh, this was a time when preachers pretty much dominated the airwaves uh, uh, in cities like Baghdad, uh, such that a, you know, if you were a regular citizen, uh, you would most likely encounter at least one of these preaching assemblies or majalis al uh, in public at least once uh, during, during the week. Uh, now, preachers were also enmeshed uh, in the political scene uh, and sometimes as kind of, kind of like proxies uh, in the conflict between the uh, Abbasid caliphs and the Seljuk sultans. Um, so traditionalist preachers like the Hanbalis, uh, of which uh, you know, Ibn al-Jawzi was one of them, uh, these traditional preachers who maintained a strong populist orientation would often align themselves with the Abbasid caliphs, whereas the Seljuk sultans based in Iran uh, would dispatch uh, preachers from rival theological schools to Baghdad in order to provoke the traditionalists in their sermons. So even if uh, Abbasid Seljuk tensions rarely came down to a physical clash of arms, uh, the conflict could still be felt through the words and sermons uh, of the preachers. Now, Ibn al-Jawzi's fame in preaching eventually gained him the attention of the Abbasid Caliph al-Mustadi, uh, during whose reign he uh, would hold uh, public sermons throughout Baghdad, and most notably uh, in the courtyard of the Caliphal Palace. Now, it is very uh, uh, important and interesting to note that uh, Ibn al-Jawzi almost never preached directly uh, to the caliph alone. Uh, usually what would happen is that he would preach to a general, co uh, general congregation, general audience in the palace courtyard, uh, and the, the caliph would sometimes be in attendance. So he would usually be listening in from, uh, from a distance, usually on a balcony uh, right outside his chambers. So uh, you know, you, you have to, you know, what you get is a scene where uh, he was preaching with the caliph uh, uh, in attendance, but not directly uh, to the caliph himself, not talking directly to the caliph. Uh, now, during uh, Ibn al-Jawzi's time in the 12th century, uh, the act of preaching to rulers had become uh, a somewhat pre precarious affair. Uh, uh, it was an emotionally charged event that involved a wide range of emotional practices. Uh, the, the preacher, for one, had to be careful with his words and other nonverbal gestures. Uh, but the preacher's delivery of a sermon to the ruler uh, was usually only one half of the story. 
historical sources placed equal, if not more emphasis on the ruler's response to the sermon, often lacing it with highly emotional descriptors. Uh, the ideal outcome was one in which the preacher quote unquote triumphs uh, over the ruler, either by successfully persuading him of the importance of virtuous rule or by inducing remorse uh, in the unjust tyrant. Both scenarios are often uh, presented uh, in a very dramatized uh, yet recognizable fashion. Uh, the preacher, uh, the, the scene usually begins uh, with the ruler uh, inviting a scholar or a preacher to offer him counsel, right? And then the, the preacher then takes the opportunity to present a brief sermon, uh, which usually involves it reminding the ruler of the heavy burden of rulership uh, and the ephemeral nature of his kingdom, or by warning him about the divine punishments uh, that await him in hell uh, if he were to rule unjustly. In rare cases, uh, the preacher might allude to specific policies uh, by the ruler which were deemed to be uh, unjust or unpopular. Uh, the scene usually ends with the, pre with the ruler weeping uh, in regret after hearing the sermon uh, or even fainting in some cases. This sequence of events often uh, unfolds in such a topos-like manner that one can even read it as an emotional script. This scenario can also be read as an interplay uh, between two different emotional communities. On one hand, we have the emotional community of the hortatory preachers, the Wu'ath, uh, whose preaching assemblies often created uh, a collective emotional experience marked by intense physical reactions from the audience, ranging from screaming, weeping, and wailing uh, to the ripping of clothing and hair. On the other hand, we have the Islamic royal courts, which often revolved around the concept of haiba, and that is the kingly awe or dread of the ruler, uh, often expressed through a combination of panegyric poetry, palatial architecture, and elaborate court ceremonies. In contrast to the rupturous moods of the preaching assembly, the royal court emphasized solemnity and emotional restraint, aiming above all to amplify the mystique and loftiness of the ruler himself. Now, in the case of a successful sermon, uh, the preacher is depicted as having instilled in the ruler uh, a type of, um, you know, what I call it, a kind of pietistic political morality. Uh, by making the ruler weep or faint, uh, the preacher has somehow tamed and cut the ruler down to size and, in a way, absorbed him. Uh, at least symbolically and temporarily into his own emotional community. Although the ideal scenario remained that of a preacher who could make even uh, the most awe-inspiring ruler weep, um, cases of preachers who ended, who ended up risking or even losing their lives after preaching to rulers are scattered across the sources. One can also see these, uh, uh, these cases as a clash between two different emotional communities, uh, emotional communities of the popular preachers and of the royal court, uh, respectively. There's also a sense that this uh, clash had become more uh, acute by Ibn al Jawzi's time. Um, as he tells us, uh, whereas past rulers, such as, you know, as you can see here on the screen, such as the Abbasid Caliph Al Mansur, and you know, usually another, another you know, more tolerant Caliph is Harun al Rashid. Uh, and it tells us that you know, as, as much as these rulers could tolerate um, even the harshest of admonition by preachers, uh, rulers of his own time often felt humiliated uh, by the slightest rebuke. And so to address this problem, uh, Ibn al-Jawzi wrote a treatise uh, on the relationship between rulers and scholars titled Atfal Ulama al umara wal umara al al ulama the inclination of the religious scholars toward the rulers and of the rulers towards the religious scholars. Um, now, I, I, I do want to discuss uh, this treatise briefly uh, because I, I think it, it, it provides some uh, additional context uh, for the misbah to better situate uh, where he's coming from uh, when writing the misbah. Now, the art uh, was written with two purposes in mind, uh, at least based on my reading. Uh, one, to defend scholars and preachers who visit the ruler's court in order to advise him. Uh, and second, to uh, serve as a guide for scholars and preachers who intend 
to preach to rulers. And as a guide, Ibn al-Jawzi identifies uh, several strategies for preaching to rulers, uh, and strategies that I think bear the imprint of a preacher who understood the intricate yet fragile relationship between preaching and power. So first, Ibn al-Jawzi says, uh, you know, before you even proceed with admonition, uh, you should observe the situation of the ruler. And for this, he says there are three kinds of rulers. Uh, the, the best and first kind is the ruler who is, you know, this is the just ruler. You know, this is someone who desires the truth and acts based on the Sharia. And, and he says, uh, for the just ruler, not only is helping him obligatory, uh, but visiting him is, is also considered a form of worship, a form of ibadah. That's the, the word he uses. Um, the, the, the second kind is the ruler who, you know, kind of oscillates between right and wrong. Uh, and, and, and for this kind, he says, uh, it, is necessarily, uh, it is necessary for scholars to counsel them politely uh, and not leave them to their own whims and fancies. You, know, you cannot leave them with their own hawa. No, that, that's the word he uses. And lastly, we have the oppressive and transgressive tyrant. And uh, for this kind, Ibn al-Jawzi says, uh, although it is permissible to use harsh language, harshness is usually futile uh, because tyrants do not tolerate overbearing preachers. The preacher might even end up risking his life if the tyrant feels even slightly humiliated. Although there are many examples of scholars during the first centuries of Islam who spoke boldly to an al-Mansur or a Harun al-Rashid, rulers in subsequent periods were not so patient. And so when it comes to tyrants, it is preferable, according to Ibn al-Jawzi, for the preacher to preach with politeness and tact. And the Arabic word used here is salatuf, uh, which is the, the fifth form of the word latafa, uh, which means uh, to, you know, to be kind or friendly or nice. Um, uh, now, being in the fifth form, uh, talatuf also has the added connotation of you know, subtly keeping up appearances to, you know, to be kind or friendly or nice, and uh, in a way adopting uh, a, a canny attitude in one's attempt to counsel rulers. So in this sense, uh, as preachers should be sensitive towards a ruler's emotional dispositions, uh, they should also know when to change course uh, when a shift is detected in, a, in, in the ruler's mood. And uh, besides uh, Talatov, uh, he outlines other strategies as well, and these include uh, avoiding speaking to rulers as one would to the masses, and avoiding addressing a sermon directly to the ruler. And lastly, to ensure that the, the, the sermon is truly effective in appealing to the ruler's emotional and moral sensitivities, uh, Ibn al-Jawzi says that uh, it, is necessarily, uh, it is necessary to mix admonition with panegyric. Uh, statements about the rewards pertaining to justice should incorporate some words of caution against injustice in the gentlest way possible. Now, panegyric uh, can come in several forms. Uh, one way is to remind the ruler of the noble nature of rulership so that he's given due recognition of the loftiness of his office and yet reminded of the heavy burden of rulership. One can also mention past examples of good rulers. Uh, and in fact, Ibn al-Jawzi's political writings are filled with stories about the virtuous acts of past rulers um, you know, such as the Umayyads and the Abbasids, and, and, and also more, more, more mythical um, rulers from, from, from the, from the pre-Islamic past. Um, and as he tells us in his other writings, uh, the scholastic arguments of the jurists and theologians might appeal to one's mind and reason, uh, but biographies have a, a, a higher emotional efficacy in softening and reforming the heart. All right, so th those were um, Ibn al-Jawzi's strategies for preaching to a ruler uh, in, in a nutshell. Um, now, unfortunately, we, uh, we only have one eyewitness account of how his, of how his sermons uh, were actually performed from beginning to end. And, and this is the, the very famous account by Ibn Jubair, uh, who, you know, during his travels, visited Baghdad and, and uh, visit and, and, act and actually attended, I, I think, three of, of Ibn al-Jawzi's um, uh, much less al uh, in, in the city itself, and and this and you know he he, he kind of records um, what happened uh, during his sermons. Uh, unfortunately, besides this, uh, you you have Ibn al-Jawzi's own account, but 
usually it's not detailed at all. It, it just talks about, you know, oh, I, I, I spoke in front of this crowd and who so and so uh, were in attendance. So, you know, it doesn't really tell you what happens uh, in, in, in these sermons. Uh, but uh, we, uh, what we do have uh, uh, is writings by him uh, that I think offer a glimpse of how these strategies were actually applied. Uh, and so here uh, you have a statement that he made to uh, his patron caliph al-Mustadi. And so he says, O commander of the faithful, if I speak, I fear you. If I stay silent, I fear for you. But I put my fear for you above my fear of you due to my love for you. Verily, God has not created anyone in rank above you, so do not be content if there is anyone more grateful to God than yourself. Now, I, I, I think um, uh, uh, William Reddy's uh, emotives can be seen in this statement, uh, um, you, know, in, you know, in which, you know, here you have Ibn al-Jawzi uh, mustering uh, the two emotions of fear and love to draw the caliph into his sermon, right? Uh, fear of the caliph is juxtaposed with fear for the caliph's soul, uh, both, both of which are subsumed under uh, the preacher's supposed love for the caliph. And then he props up the caliph's pride and ego by reminding him of his lofty position above all of humankind, and then ends with its core message, exhorting the caliph to be grateful to God. Now, in addition to this example, uh, we have the misbah, uh, which was uh, dedicated to the caliph al-Mustadi himself. Um, now, uh, in term, if you want to look at, at, at a typology of mirror for princes, um, uh, the misbah is what scholars like uh, Louise Marlowe and Julie Scott Misami uh, would call a homiletic mirror for princes, uh, which is more concerned with the ruler's morals and commitment to faith and less on governmental administration. So in essence, uh, less statecraft, more soulcraft. Now, he, uh, here's a, the, you know, if you're interested, the, the, this is the table of contents for the work itself. And, um, and, and I think by, by just by looking at the table of contents, uh, you know, you can easily detect a, a very heavy emphasis on admonition and exhortation. Um, I mean, you ju ju just look at, you know, chapters two to five, and then, you know, chapters uh, 12 to uh, 16, you know, it, it, you know, about 10 chapters more or less on, 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 just, on this topic of preaching and, ad and, and admonition itself. Um, uh, you know, which I think is not surprising since this is, after all, a homiletic mirror. Uh, and so, um, you know, there's not a lot of concrete advice, for instance, on practical and, administ and administrative, uh, administrative affairs in government. Um, uh, and, and in fact, uh, practical and administrative affairs only occupy about one fifth of the entire work, whereas most of the misbah is devoted to informing the caliph about the importance of exhortation and, and, and examples of past rulers uh, being, ad, uh, being admonished uh, by scholars and ascetics. Now, even for the chapters dealing with, say, uh, justice, uh, self-conduct, governance, and the management of wealth, uh, Ibn al-Jawzi's advice is usually very generic, very general, uh, largely consists of quotations from the Quran as well as hadiths. Um, you know, so if you take, for example, uh, chapter nine uh, uh, on the governance of subjects, um, uh, he tells us that subjects are further divided into two groups. Uh, you know, this is the, the elites and the commoners, the, the khawas and the awam. Um, but uh, his discussion here is, is noticeably briefer uh, than what is usually encountered in other mirrors, uh, where you would come across pretty detailed discussions of different categories of the khawas and, 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 and the strategies you should use to uh, govern the awam. Um, in the 10th century, uh, Nasihat al-Muluk attributed to al-Mawardi, for instance, uh, which is, has been uh, you know, very thoroughly analyzed by Louis Marlowe, uh, you know, the, the author Pseudo Mawardi uh, discusses, for instance, the, the education of princes and retainers. Uh, he talks about the qualities required for those who hold office. Uh, it talks about the ways to implement punishments, different kinds of punishments among the populace, uh, and, and, and also uh, the frequency of, of, of holding uh, the madalin, the, the, the court for the redress of, of grievances. Um, 
I mean, good looking to another example, uh, Nizam al uh, you know, you'll see chapters on spies, on boon companions, on army salaries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but all of this detail is virtually absent uh, in the Misbah. Uh, instead, we have uh, general statements, uh, mostly hadiths, uh, advising al study to govern with uh, for uh, uh, compassion and forbearance, uh, advising him to select the best man for official positions uh, and to treat his subjects uh, in ways that he wants to be treated himself. Uh, so, you know, if you just want to sum things up, you know, on the whole, in, instead of concrete advice on how uh, to do all of that, uh, you have uh, general advice on the importance of, of doing all, all, um, all these things. So which means that if you're looking to use the Misbah as a source for the inner workings of, say, the 12th century Abbasid court, uh, you are not going to find much, if any at all. Uh, this lack of detail should remind us that although Ibn al-Jawzi was close to the caliphal court and was close to you know, the caliph himself, uh, he was not an insider member of it and thus not privy to the inner workings of government. The preacher, the, the misbah is after all the work of a preacher, not of a statesman. Now, even though there is nothing particularly remarkable about the misbah in terms of content, uh, especially with respect to content related to state and government, uh, I think what makes it stand out is its structure, its overall structure. Uh, and it's in its structure that we get a glimpse of Ibn al-Jawzi's preaching strategy in, uh, in, in action and how uh, these strategies relate to emotions. Now, um, on the whole, of course, the, the Misbah is, is uh, very obviously a book, uh, but I think we can read it as a sermon to the caliph, though in this case, a, a very long 700 page sermon. Uh, if we follow the progression of the chapters from top to bottom, uh, we see that in the first chapter, the caliph is praised and reminded of the importance of the caliphate for humankind. Uh, and in the next four chapters, the, this is where the author tries to reel the caliph in to listen to whatever advice and counsel he has to offer in the rest of the book. And uh, you know, here the caliph is told, uh, to be grateful to God, uh, you know, it's a common refrain in Ibn al-Jawzi's, um, uh, in, in, in the Misbah itself, uh, and he says, among the ways to show gratitude to God is by, well, unsurprisingly, listening to exhortation and, and advice, listening to sermons, uh, and then we move to the middle of the treatise, uh, where the caliph is told about the importance of justice, and, you know, he's given advice on self-governance, uh, governance of his subjects, and, and the management of wealth. Then comes the longest chapter of the work, chapter 11, uh, which contains uh, short biographies of past caliphs. Uh, many of these biographies feature caliphs seeking religious knowledge, uh, weeping excessively, uh, engaging in prayer, and interacting with scholars. Now, interestingly, uh, political and military activities are barely mentioned, thereby hinting at what kind of ruler Ibn al-Jawzi wanted to see in his own caliph. Now, insofar as this is a direct application of Ibn al-Jawzi's advice for preachers to invoke past example, uh, to, to invoke example, uh, examples of past rulers, uh, biographies are also relevant for someone like the Abbasid Caliph, who is part of a long-standing dynasty. Now, it is one thing to hear about other rulers doing great things, but quite another to hear about your own ancestors doing great things. And finally, we get to chapter 16, which I view as the emotional climax of the Misbah. Uh, in this chapter, the homiletic tone of the work reaches its highest pitch, whereby the caliph is presented with sayings lamenting the radical uh, uncertainty of what awaits him in the afterlife. Uh, one of these sayings has the Prophet Muhammad pleading to God to help him bear the agonies of death. Uh, another offers vivid detail about how people will sweat so profusely out of fear on the day of resurrection that their sweat will sink 70 cubits deep into the earth and then rise up to their ears. You know, you also have a, you also have a saying where you have a grave, a grave itself, by the way, warning the evildoers that walk by that their own graves will, will start to close in on them until their ribs start crushing, you know, crushing each other. Um, so, you know, it's a very, very highly, you know, this is a, you know, highly, very highly emotional uh, chapter, which now brings me to the question of emotions. Now, in a series of articles he wrote a few decades ago, 
uh, the late Merlin Schwartz concludes that a typical preaching assembly, a majlis al wa'az by Ibn al Jawzi, uh, can be divided into, into three parts uh, and, uh, and, and, and can, be, can also be characterized by a certain movement. Uh, it typically starts with a recitation of scripture, a prayer, and the praise of God. And, and, and this, in a way, appeals to the congregation's spiritual sensitivities. This is then followed by an interpretation of Quranic verses and a didactic uh, kind of Q&A session that uh, appeal to the audience's uh, intellectual interests. The assembly ends by appealing to the, the audience's moral uh, concerns by way of a sermon, by way of a, of a, of a wa'ath sermon, uh, summoning them to live by the prescriptions of the Sharia and warning those who are lax in these matters about the eschatological punishments that await them in the afterlife. And by the way, this, is, uh, this was also the structure that Ibn al-Jawzi uh, himself recommended for preachers uh, in his own manual for preaching, uh, Kitab al-Qusas wal Muzakirin. Now, I argue that movement is likewise present in the misbah, but the movement in the misbah is also marked by shifts in emotions if we read it from beginning to end, what I call an emotional movement. And for this, I, uh, I'm going to say that I, I draw inspiration from Karen Bauer's notion of an emotional plot, um, uh, which she defines as uh, the specific series of emotions that lead the listener from one emotional state into another emotional state uh, as the listener hears uh, different passages in the Quran. So, you know, stories as well as uh, promise and, and threat passages in the Quran. So how is the emotional uh, movement achieved in the misbah? Now, looking back at the table of contents from top to bottom, we see that the, the author first elevates uh, the, the caliph's sense of pride by stressing the importance of the caliphate to humankind, and that he reels him in to pay attention to the more didactic material that comes next in chapters 6 to 11. Much attention is given to uh, the conduct of past caliphs as didactic tools and models for the caliph to emulate. And so here we, we uh, in a sense, we, we see not so much peer pressure, but kind of, kind of ancestor pressure uh, as the caliph might feel a sense of uh, perhaps guilt or shame if he was not already living up to the standards set uh, by his Abbasid ancestors. And finally, the author inundates the caliph with eschatological reminders about the torments of the afterlife to elicit feelings of fear and anxiety. Here it's important to note that in Ibn al-Jawzi's preaching assemblies, the concluding sermon, uh, which consisted of pious harangues and vivid eschatolo eschatological imageries, was also usually when where, uh, was also usually when intense emotional outbursts can be observed, uh, with audience members often weeping, screaming, throwing themselves at him, and even uh, and, and even offering their own heads to be shaved as well. Um, and uh, it, it is with this structure in mind that I argue that the misbah can be read as a very long auditory sermon to um, our study. Ibn al Jawzi is, in effect, bringing the Majlis al Wa'az to an Abbasid caliph who uh, pretty much spent the first half of his reign uh, mostly secluded from the public. So, in other words, this is a mirror for princes designed for a politically and militarily passive caliph. So to conclude, if we only read the misbah as a source for, say, sophisticated political theory or for information about the late Abbasid court in the 12th century, uh, we might be ready to conclude that this is overall a very unimpressive mirror for princes, at least compared to the likes of uh, Nizam al-Muk's uh, Siyasat Nameh, uh, Turtushi's uh, Siraj al-Muluk, and K. Kaus's uh, Gabus Nameh, uh, among, among others. But when we look at the misbah in relation to Ibn al jawzis other writings, such as the Atfal Ulama, and to the history of emotions, we might come to better appreciate it as bookmarking a period when preachers dominated the airwaves in late Abbasid Baghdad. Some preachers like Ibn al jawzi uh, enjoyed close relationships with the royal courts. Uh, and, and, I, and I think the misbah uh, reflects this close yet tenuous relationship between uh, preaching and political power uh, and its use of homiletic tools and rhetorical strategies to reform the ruler's morals. 
So if collective or tag uh, can be considered a, a mode of political engagement, uh, I, I think the misbah represents talatuf in action. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, Hansen. That was that was splendid indeed. And I'm absolutely sure we will we will have plenty of questions and, and comments. Um I'm or um already very sorry for for our audience later who won't won't see this because I'm I'm going to cut off the 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 recording as in order to to let the uh, question and uh, the answers to be as free as possible. Um yeah, yeah, it is just uh, you, the way you performed it, uh it it's really does justice to the to the oratory <laughs> art. Uh I, I feel kind of a tut up. Uh so this influence of a of a great performance and an in, into intellectual uh emotional refreshment uh due to your talk. So thank you, thank you very much indeed. Before before uh, we start uh, with the questions, I I'd like to put into the chat uh, <clears throat> some uh, some links about um, a talk we had in Exeter, and then then I put it uh, up to the uh, to our website, which was by Paul Hack, mm -hmm. and it was on emotions, uh, namely on weeping. And that was a, a splendid lecture. I think all of us who who were there uh, really loved it. So I will I will put the links here. And I, I, if I don't know whether you knew that he he was working on on that, uh, um, but but I, you I will. Yeah, he, he he told me about it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> but of a feather. Uh, and then here, here is the other one, just a second. So, yeah, and then this is the, the um, copy link address. And then, so both copied here in the chat. And then the other thing I want to, to share with everyone is the list of uh, our forthcoming majlises, starting with that of Stephen next week on the Umayyad problem in Arabic history, historiography, and then Helen Pfeiffer, an Ottoman majlis, which was meant to finish the series, but we we, we have now two additional uh, sessions, Hassan Abbas, the return of the Taliban, <laughs> the, the, the Africans, the Afghanistan after the Americans left, I don't, oh my goodness. Sorry, my daughter has just came in with a new keyboard. And then um, the Nabil Hussein uh, will talk about the constructing memories of Ali in Sunni and Shi Islam. So we have we will have more treats than originally planned, and I think this is a great thing. I put it all in into the chat. Okay, now thank you again, Hansian. I close the uh, recording stop the recording and and then um, we can we can start the discussion <laughs>